Well, good evening. My name is Pastor Jeremy Upton, and I want to welcome you to Kingdom Seekers Bible Study. This is our opportunity at the Refuge Church to dive into the Word on a deeper level, at a deeper basis. And so I look forward to uh, spending these next few moments with you. But more importantly, we need the presence of God's Holy Spirit in this moment with us. So if you don't mind, bow your head right where you are, and let's invite His presence into our study on tonight. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We bless you. We magnify you. We honor you because there's no God like you. Lord, we thank you for your watch care over us as your people and thank you for bringing us to this moment, this time, in this evening that we could take some time out and study your word. So Lord, I thank you for what you've been doing and the watch care that you've given over our lives. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have the forgiveness of sin and the newness of life that he's brought us into by his obedient sacrifice. And now, Lord, I pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to move in these next few moments. Stand in my body, think with my mind, speak with my tongue, allow your word to come forth with power, with conviction, and that you would marry it to each and every need, custom fit it to each and every person who's taking part on tonight to the end that you might get the glory. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, I declare you are my strength and my redeemer in Jesus name. Amen. Well, listen, I'm so excited. We've been walking through this study over the last few weeks um, where we've been kind of talking through and we've kind of been marrying up some some deep knowledge that we need to have, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. Uh, Because this year our theme is uh, based upon Ephesians 2 and 10, uh, where the Bible talks about that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And we've been dealing with that idea as as the understanding of we're built for this. Uh, One of the things that we're believing that we're built for is to be armed and dangerous with an understanding of God's Word and and understanding uh, in these days where there's so much uh, nonsense and false teaching going forth that we would know how to walk in a, a, a solid truth of the doctrine that we hold. And so I've been walking through this whole idea of uh, uh, how great a salvation, where I'm taking the doctrine of salvation, soteriology, as that aspect is called, and I've been walking through some of the major tenets of it. And so on tonight, I want to look at uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, as I try to wrap all of this together, 1 John chapter 4, um, beginning at verse 13, verses 13, 14, 15, and 16 from the New Living Translation. Uh, If you have it, uh, I pray that you would get it right there and that you would follow along. Uh, Watch what the Bible says. And God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in His love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. Uh, listen, uh, I want to deal with tonight uh, the, the concept of having an assurance of our salvation. Now, one of the unique things about the, the Orthodox Christian faith, the, the, the right teaching, the biblical teaching of the Christian faith is unlike most religious systems, uh, our Christian faith gives us a certainty as the adherents, as the believers, as the followers. Uh, in Islam, you have to hope that when you get to the end of your life, Allah takes the good deeds that you've done and the bad deeds, and you've got to hope that the good outweighs the bad. Uh, in Hinduism, you have to hope that you've built up enough karma that you would uh, be able to advance to the next level on your way or on your journey to experience nirvana. Uh, In New Age humanism, you have to believe that uh, you, or you have to hope that you can get over your guilt long enough and pretend like you're a good person despite the the stuff that you know about you so that you can convince yourself that there's no accountability because there's no life after you die. That either way, in whatever system that you believe in, other than Christianity, there are no guarantees. 
Uh, but as a Jesus follower, you and I have been given assurances that help us know where we stand with him and w that the eternal rewards of heaven or an everlasting existence or an eternal life are granted freely by the finished work of Christ. Uh, in soteriology, in the, the, the category of theology that deals with salvation, we refer to these guarantees as the having an assurance of your salvation. So we want to deal with, we want to look at, well, what are the assurances? Well, the first one, and I hope you have the notes, you're able to get them from the link or get them from our website. The first assurance that we are given is, first of all, we just read it a few minutes ago. We have the Spirit's internal witness. Look back at 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says, and God has given us his Spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. He provides proofs. Now, I don't know how it happens, but there's something when the Holy Spirit comes on the inside, you, you can feel it, you can sense it, you ought to experience, and then along the way, he proves that he's there. Not only does he provide proofs, but then he also prompts affirmation. The, the Spirit on the inside provides affirmation. Look at Romans chapter 8, Verse 16, this is Bible study, so you got to follow along in your Bible. Romans 8, 16 says that the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Uh, what, what's one of the things that happens when the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the one who confesses faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ? He moves in and His presence there, He begins to prove that He is there. And he, us feeling that is proof that we are in Him, that His Spirit testifies with our spirit, that, that he communicates with the spiritual aspect of us and he begins to comfort and he begins to assure and he begins to affirm and he begins to help us get over those humps of doubt that sometimes show up uh, throughout every regular Jesus followers Christian journey. If you ever have had doubts about your salvation, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It simply means the enemy, is, as the accuser of the brethren, is trying to make you think that what happened did not happen. But the Holy Spirit's job is to counteract that with his internal witness. But then secondly, the second uh, aspect of those assurances are our personal experiences. Go back to 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Uh, John the, the Revelator, John the Apostle says, Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. And we know how much God loves us, and He when we have put our trust in His love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Notice in verse 14, John talks about what we have seen, but then he talks about in verse 15 what we confess, and then he talks in verse 16 what we know. Watch this. No, look at that. See, say, no. See, confess, no. Notice that uh, as John talks about his personal experience of knowing Jesus, he puts it in the context of how we as believers also begin to know and the experience, the, no, the knowledge that we belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, first of all, one of the things that happens is that we get convinced in our personal experiences by the inward shift in us. I don't know what your, your salvation experience was like, but I knew something had happened on the inside when something shifted in my intentions and my desires and my wants. Watch this. Watch what 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says. I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, Paul says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Paul says, I, I have shifted from, from I, I used to be ashamed of my actions, but now because he's shifting things in me, I'm no, I'm no longer feeling the way that I used to feel because of what I now know about him. I, we're, we get convinced by the internal shift in us, but we also get convinced by a sense of relationship. Notice that Paul has just said, for I, I am knowing, I know whom I have believed in. Uh, 
John says in, in 1 John 4, he talks about the fact that we have seen him, we know him, we have experienced him, and we're able to confess what we know and the love that we have in him. That, that sense of relationship, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence on the inside, he connects us on a direct line to Jesus and to the Father so that there is this new relationship that we're brought into and there's something in us, the way that God built us spiritually, we can sense that we are not alone. That may be one of the greatest things about salvation, knowing that you're not facing anything alone. But it doesn't stop there. One of the other aspects of our personal experience that, that begins to give us an assurance that we belong to Jesus is we get convinced by the word. Look what happens in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John says, I have written this to you, talking about his letter, talking about scripture. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. One of the things that needs to happen once you and I get saved is we've got to get connected to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church because when the Word of God comes forth, we will find ourselves and we'll find this relationship with God and we'll find how we can know that we know that we know down in our knower. When you hear me use that expression, I'm dealing with the fact that the Holy Spirit's internal witness hooks up with our spirit and with our experience and wraps it all in the Word so that we can know know what we cannot see, that we can have a knowledge of this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ that changes everything because we continue to practice it in what we say and in what we see and in what we understand from the Word of God. Now listen, uh, I, I, I have pastored long enough and I have been a Christian and a Jesus follower and trying to help others grow one step closer to Jesus Christ every single day long enough to know that there's always the question that comes up. Well, pastor, what happens? I get saved, but what happens when I sin? What happens when I mess up? What ha how do I know that I'm still in and I'm still good if I have just sinned? Right. And, and that's that's a major question, because for many of us, we grew up uh, in a different kind of orthodox, not, not not bad theology, but a different kind of brand that says, well, if you sin, that you can lose your salvation, that, that you have your sin has severed the relationship that you used to have with God through Jesus Christ. Um, now, let me just say this right out. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but but. Um, what you got taught as it relates to can I lose my salvation let me be clear that there is clear biblical arguments that people use to say you can lose your salvation uh, they, the, the, the strongest ones in my uh, in my understanding are like Matthew 5:13 if the salt loses its flavor it's good for nothing but to be cast out uh, John 15 and 2 that deals with if the vine is if the branch isn't producing fruit it it's he, he takes it away uh, Hebrews 6 and 6 I brought it up last week but well if 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 you knew and have experienced this and if you turn there's no more uh, no more sacrifice for sin uh, Hebrews 10 26 goes along that same route. Uh, 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22 uh, also kind of takes that same tone. Uh, so there is biblical arguments to say that you could, that people use to say you could lose your salvation. Um, now, let me say about these that I think that most of the good biblical arguments are, are better understood in the context that they come. You got to ask, is Jesus talking to non-believers? Is he talking to disciples? If he's talking to disciples, I need to know that. Is he referring to salvation or is he talking to disciples about the reward system for their faithfulness that will happen in the millennial kingdom, which you don't get into the millennial kingdom unless you already have salvation? So I, I, when, when they're used as proof text, I think that that messes up some stuff because many times most of those texts that can be used by those who say you can lose your salvation, when you go back and check the context, uh, it may be dealing with the rewards of the millennial kingdom and not eternal salvation. Or, or in some cases, like the ones in Hebrews or 2 Peter 2, 20-22, um, these are warnings given to believers about apostasy, about uh, 
following false teachers who turn you from the truth. And let me just say, let me just throw off in here parenthetically, that's why you got to be careful who you listening to on YouTube and who you let feed you on Instagram and on their channels because not every, uh, some of the, one of the hallmarks of good teaching is it sounds good and it feels good, but it may not be good. Uh, because one of the things that can happen is false teaching can, can mess up and cause us to turn from the truth of who Jesus is. And there's a lot of bad stuff out there being said in good ways. Uh, but now having said that, let me go back and say that the arguments that people use biblically saying that you can lose your salvation, they are biblical arguments. Okay, let me say that. However, there are more biblical texts that talk against us being able to lose our salvation. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Romans 8, 28 through 30, or Romans 8, uh, 38 and 39. I, I love John 10, 28 and 29. Jesus says, those who believe in me are, are in the Father's hands and no man can pluck them out. Uh, Romans 5, 9 through 10 is also another one. Hebrews 7, 25, uh, John 17 and 11, Jesus prays and says, I will not lose all of them. I won't lose any of them. So if Jesus, as the Son of God, prays to God and God the Father hears but does not answer all of his prayers, there's a problem there. Uh, uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 12, which we'll, we, we, we've covered, uh, 1 Peter 1, 4 through 5, those are strong biblical arguments that we are not able to lose our salvation. Now, theologically, I think there are some good arguments too. Um, the, the idea of eternal security or knowing that you will have your salvation into eternity, that eternal security, uh, one, one theologian says, Eternal security is that work of God which guarantees that the gift of salvation once received is possessed forever and cannot be lost. Well, why is that? I think the theological argument has to be made for the sovereignty of God, the, the, the overarching rulership and power of God. Because salvation, by definition, is a work by which God provided the payment that he required to satisfy his own wrath. It was a work of God, by God, for God. There were, the, the human activity doesn't factor into the equation. So whenever we take the focus off what God did and provided and put it back on human ability, it, it takes away and it diminishes the, the ability of the God being the one who secures our salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, another theologian says it like this, a justification which is not subject to human merit, cannot be subject then to human demerit. If I didn't earn it, I can't lose it. If it had to be given as a gift, God's not going to charge me for it, right? Um, I, I think that sovereignty of God is a good argument for why uh, the salvation that he provides, we cannot lose. But I also, uh, another theological argument for me is God's pattern of how he handles unconditional covenants. He makes an unconditional covenant with Abraham, and he will follow that through all the way to the eternal kingdom. Once he sets in motion an unconditional covenant, he does not stop it. Our salvation, what was given to us through Jesus Christ, is an unconditional covenant. And I think it will follow the pattern of the other unconditional covenant that Scripture teaches us. But now let me, let me get to this bottom line. Uh, all orthodox or all correct traditions agree on at least three, these three points. That God desires every believer to have salvation and to keep it and has the power to provide it. Number two, God has given every believer everything they need in order to remain faithful. Believers continued salvation, thirdly, is not based on their works, but on God's grace. Everybody, whether you're in the camp that believes that you can lose salvation or the, if you're in the one that can't, we all agree on those things. So let me say this, if you got taught somewhere in your Christian journey that you can lose your salvation, those people were teaching you word of God. They're, they're not false teachers. They're not going to hell. Okay. Um, however, uh, I don't think based upon biblical teaching 
and the revelation of the character and the sovereignty of God that a human who truly trusts Jesus Christ as Savior, I don't think Scripture teaches that we can lose our salvation. Now, that does not mean that we can take grace for granted and live any old kind of way and live raggedy. I believe this scripture is very clear on God's desire for our holiness. However, there is enough biblical evidence to suggest that God will preserve his name and reputation to the point that he can and often does remove through death those who claim to be saints but try to live like ain'ts. So let me say it again. That, that, that means uh, that, that there is biblical evidence to suggest that salvation can be lost, though I don't think we do. However, I think that we ought to behave and conduct ourselves like salvation could be lost. I don't think he can, but I don't think they're wrong who teach otherwise because of the desire for the holiness and for sanctification and submission to the Spirit of God. So in whatever camp that you live in, the issue is whatever you believe, we ought to behave in holiness. I hope that makes sense to you. I don't think you can lose your salvation because it's a work of God, by God, and for God. But I think you ought to live like you can. Does that make sense? Now, uh, let, let, let's deal with this. What happens when I sin? Uh, look, if you're in 1 John, go to 1 John 1, verse 9. The Bible says this. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What, what happens if I sin? What if I mess up? First of all, confess it. Right? Confess it. Uh, the word confess, in the original, the word confess means to say the same thing as God about my sin. I can't rationalize it. I can't say, well, that's just how I am. Well, you didn't know what was going on. And well, you, you, you shouldn't judge me because you don't know my life. When I am caught in sin and I know it and the Holy Spirit convicts of it, I ought to say about my sin the same thing God says, which means I have to own it. It's, my, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I have, to, I have to own it, but I have to admit it. He says, if we confess our sins, if we would be bold enough and brash enough and godly enough and embarrassed enough to, to get over that hump and to admit it to God, he can then deal with it because once I own it and once I admit it to him, then I can get forgiven for it. And, and, and so if I sin, I confess it. So that as I own it, as I admit it, he can forgive me of that sin. But then secondly, and, uh, and I'm going back to what we dealt with last week, we can repent from it. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 9. I love this verse. Watch this one. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Watch what the Bible says. Peter is preaching on, on, uh, in the early days of the church. He says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Remember, I talked about last week, repentance isn't just for unbelievers. It's mainly for believers. Repent means, whenever you see the word repent in the New Testament, that, that Greek word deals with a change of thinking that leads to a change in direction. That as I'm going this way, I discover that I've made a wrong turn. And if I change my mind about this isn't going to get me to where I want to go. And as I turn and change direction, I have repented. Does that make sense? Uh, that, that's why Romans 2 and 4, when it deals with repentance, it, it, all, it, it says that God is gracious to give us time to get our stuff together to repent. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 7.10 talks about how godly sorrow, how, how God will beat us up on the inside by His Spirit when we've done wrong because He wants to lead us to change our minds so we can change our direction. Revelation 2 and 5 tells us to, re to repent. Remember where you have fallen from and go back and do the first work. Go, go back to where you started before you messed up. So, so watch this. Repentance, and if we would repent of that sin, it means that we have a change in our thinking about that behavior or that attitude or that thought that was sin. But then secondly, we have to put things and accountability in place 
to pivot from that bad behavior. If you need somebody to call you, if you need somebody who will be spiritual enough to, to be able to get a text from you and, and, or someone who will check up on you, if that's what it takes to pivot and change the behavior, then you got to do it. But the Bible says, I love it. Peter says, repent and turn back to him so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Something happens when we repent of our sin and when we change our mind so that we change our behavior and change our direction, we get this refreshing that comes from the Spirit of God. He, he renews us. He refreshes us. And he, he fills us back up again with, with all that we need to keep moving in the direction that God has for us. So listen. I submit to you that we have this amazing, great salvation. It's a great salvation because of what it rescues us from. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, but we were rescued by Jesus. It's a great salvation because of how it's offered to us. It is a free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a great salvation because of how it's received. He shows up and declares us righteous, even though he knows we're guilty. It's a great salvation because of what it means for us. It means we don't have to stay stuck. It means we don't have to live in fear. It means that we don't have to be bound and enslaved by those old things. But it's also a great salvation because of how it assures us that His Spirit works in me to give me an experience that I know that I'm His, and that even when I mess up, he, He's made provisions for how I can stay in right relationship with Him. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He said that in Romans 1 and 16, and so I pray that you and I would live in and walk out and be unashamed of this salvation that we've been given freely through Jesus Christ. Can I pray for us? Father, I thank you and I bless you for your word. Thank you that yours is the only faith system where we can be assured that we can know in whom we have believed and we can be persuaded that you're able to keep that which we commit to you until the day of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I thank you for the promises of your word. I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the ability to walk in security, knowing that you've secured not only my right now, but also my future. Lord, we love you and we bless you. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I, I appreciate you so much for spending this time with us at Kingdom Seekers Bible Study this Wednesday night. I invite you to join us for our worship experience on YouTube or on Facebook this coming Sunday. I want to make some announcements. Uh, we, we haven't been doing too much during this hunkering down, uh, but there's some things that there, there's some prayer stuff that God is kind of pressing on the hearts of myself and the elders that we need to get into. And I'm going to make some announcements for how we're going to do that uh, on next Wednesday. We'll start a, a new kind of interesting format uh, as we move into uh, talking about some of the how to's of prayer. Uh, as we shift into this time of uncertainty and not knowing uh, what's going to happen when they open the state, when they open the nation back up and uh, what's going to happen with schools and uh, God bless the poor high school seniors, pray for them. Uh, but as we as we talk about what to pray for, uh, we want to be uh, armed and dangerous for how we pray. And so I invite you to keep sticking with us because we're going to start moving into in the end of this month and into May, we're going to start moving into doing some prayer things and some prayer needs. Also, stay tuned to our refuge text line because there's going to be some information I'm going to share with you, a couple of videos of some things that God has placed on my heart that we can keep moving and getting ready for what's next. He's not just the God of now, but he's also the God who has a plan for what's next, not only for our church, but for your life. And so don't get discouraged. Don't get weary in well-doing because the God of what's next has some new things for you in the next step. Listen, I love you so much. It hurts. I love you and I can't even help it. I love you and there's nothing that you can do about it. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you this Sunday. God bless you and may the blessings of God rest on you.